Here's an idea. Maybe the Earth is computing the answer to life, the universe, and everything. If you're unfamiliar with Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the comedic sci-fi radio show turned novels, turned miniseries, turned movie, turned... Well, you get the idea. First off, you gotta promise that as soon as this video is over, you're gonna go read some of it. It's so good. But more importantly, there is some stuff that we have to get straight before we go much further. So there are slight spoilers ahead, but also you're 20 years late, so... Yeah. So that being said, anyone familiar with the paperwork process necessary to save Vogon's mother from the bug-blooded beast of Trawl can set their infinite improbability drive to these coordinates. We'll meet you there. So, The Hitchhiker's Guide is about, roughly speaking, everything. Life, the universe, its inconsistencies, confusiosity, and its hilarious mysteries. One of those hilarious mysteries, perhaps the most important one, is about the question of life, the universe, and everything. Because of the machinations of a very smart computer called Deep Thought, we know the answer to that question is 42. 42. Which isn't too helpful, is it? The problem is that we know the answer, 42, but not the actual question, because the question of life, the universe, and everything isn't actually a question, is it? No, it isn't. Dreadful. So here we are, armed with the most powerful information in the galaxy with no idea how to use it. How do we suss this out? Simple. Build another computer, more powerful than the first one, which gave us the answer to give us the question. Aha! Splendid. And that computer? Well, it just happens to be Earth. Which, in the Hitchhiker's Guide, is destroyed to make way for a hyperspace bypass before its final calculations are done, but that's of secondary importance right now. What is of primary concern is what it would mean if Douglas Adams were onto something. What if the Earth, and the rest of the universe for that matter, were a computer? I mean, I know it sounds baddie, but baddier things are true. Anglerfish are a thing, and uh, Arrested Development is back. So how might it be that the universe computes? Well, let's start easy. What does a computer do exactly? It operates on information. It engages in processes, mechanical and electrical, that make decisions. Those decisions are based on programs, which at their heart are bits, just little ones and zeros. The output of the program is fed back into the system and the information processing and creation continues. What, by comparison then, is the universe? Well, it's nothing if not information, right? Sure, it's galaxies and stars and planets and dolphins and towels, but all of those things are just made up of atoms, which themselves are made up of particles in different states that describe all of the stuff. Furthermore, the universe is certainly the processes which create and operate on all of that information. Hashtag physics. Now this whole idea really starts to take shape once we get down into the nitty gritty, or itty bitty, as the case may be. Emphasis being on bit, t bit, t. Remember all of those ones and zeros? So as it turns out, the way that they behave inside a normal computer is pretty comparable to the way atoms behave inside a universe computer. Now it's true that our ontological metaphors tend to follow whatever the in vogue technology of the day is. The human brain and the universe have variously been described as books and libraries, clocks and factories, but this one, the computer has some pretty convenient correlations. Like how the universe and its atoms, much like a computer, have a binary foundation. Theoretical physicist and Niels Bohr bro John Wheeler put it like this. It is not unreasonable to imagine that information sits at the core of physics in the same way it sits at the core of a computer. It from bit. Otherwise put, every bit, every particle, every field of force, even the space-time continuum itself, derives its function, its meaning, its very existence entirely from the apparatus elicited answers to yes or no questions. Binary choices, bits. It from bit has become a kind of mantra in a sometimes controversial line of thinking variously called digital physics, digital philosophy, digital ontology, digital, so on and so forth. These theories hold that nature performs or is the result of calculation, meaning that nature, the earth, maybe even our brains are deterministic. They're programmed. They are the moving parts or the result of a process which is run by a program that has a goal. This idea is huge and we can't give it the time it deserves, so if you want to know more we'll put a reading list in the doobly-doo. Now, assuming that you're sufficiently convinced of, or intrigued by, the idea of the universe computer, we can start talking about the interesting stuff like what is it computing? What is the goal of the program? Maybe it is the heat death of the universe. Its goal probably isn't the computation of the ultimate question whose answer is 42, but whatever it is, it involves us. Like, people. Douglas Adams even described Earth through deep thought as a computer of such infinite and subtle complexity that organic life itself will form part of its operational matrix. So that could mean two things. Maybe that organic life is passive, and the simulation argument is right, and we're all just currently plugged into the matrix and not actually here, and there's nothing you can do about it, so just don't panic. Or it could mean that organic life is active in that calculation. Meaning we live in, or are, a discretized, operationally complex system composed not of matter and energy, but of bits and 
algorithms. And that life and all of its endeavors, like science, art, getting really good at bocce, Douglas Adams positing that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42, are all just a pursuit of whittling down our theories about the way the world works into computable, indisputable truths. The purpose of the program then being to understand the program. Or maybe the universe isn't a computer, or on the backs of an infinite number of turtles, or sneezed out by the great green arkle seizure. But really just the universe. And of course, if we could figure out how to ask that bowl of petunias why it thought, oh no, not again, before crashing into the surface of Magrathea, oh, no, we wouldn't be in this again. predicament at all. If we knew exactly why the bowl of petunias had thought that, we should know a lot more about the universe than we do now. What do you guys think? Is the universe a computer? And if so, what's it computing? Let us know in the comments. And if you look up subscribing to Idea Channel in the Hitchhiker's Guide, it reads, mostly harmless. Oh, how do I love math? Let me count the, oh wait, I can't, numbers aren't real. Let's see what you guys had to say about the existence of math. First of all, to all of our international subscribers, thank you for suffering through an entire video where I say math and not maths. That's just how we do it here in America. Um, of course, your way makes a little bit more sense. STH128 and a couple other people point out that math must be an objective part of the universe because it comes from consciousness, which is a part of the universe. But I don't know whether or not consciousness's existence is clearly non-metaphysical. I think it's not, not that cut and dry. Mannequin T points out that they agree with the idea that math is a kind of language that we use to describe the universe and goes one step further to say that it's a kind of uber language because it's shared the world over, which is a very good point. Dave Mantle points out that Brady Haran of Numberphile fame also also made some videos approaching these topics. We will put some links to those in the description. They are awesome and you should watch them. Rain Angel Triple One asks whether or not there is another language other than mathematics that we can use to describe the universe. Um, I would point you towards Hartree Field who published something called Science Without Numbers, which sort of describes itself. Um, I've seen it described as um, not easy or pleasant, but possible, and that's what's important. Mr. Brian Mann points out the embodied argument for mathematics, that we have a base 10 system because we have 10 fingers. This actually factors really heavily into the work of Lakoff and Nunez who were featured in the episode. Um, Though this isn't true for measuring lengths in America, we use a base. Uh. Ah, yes, the new pronunciation for Jaif. In case anyone is wondering, here's the IPA for it. Here's how it's spelled. Let's rotate the board. <laughs> You're welcome. To SMH Jerry. Whoa, questions that shouldn't be asked? I think we might just have to agree to disagree on the existence of those, but as far as the relationship between science and philosophy, I will leave you with some words uh, spoken by the great Ray Kurzweil. It is precisely because we cannot resolve issues of consciousness entirely through objective measurement and analysis that a critical role exists for philosophy. This week's episode was brought to you by the noses of these talented folks who were up against the grindstone. Our tweet of the week comes from Cadell Last, who points us towards a Margaret Wertheim piece about the limits of physics. It's a long one, but it's a good one. 